This meeting is being recorded. We're so grateful that you're here for the November 10th elected council meeting. Here are some upcoming events, including Thanksgiving services. The Interfaith Council is uh, doing one with Multifaith Action and Faith in Action East Bay on Sunday, November 20th at 2 p.m. at Christ the King. The Rossmore Interfaith Council is having their um, Harvest Festival on Monday the 21st from 4 to 5.30 on Zoom. And the ISERV group is doing theirs on Wednesday night, Thanksgiving Eve at 7 p.m. at Bethheim Congregation. Our next... Holy Envy is coming up in December 5th. We'll be finishing the book in chapters 12 in the epilogue. There are some new links in your agenda on our YouTube for you to look at, including last month's like the council meeting, which was a great one on disaster preparedness. And then other upcoming events, volunteer opportunities. Our next meeting will be in uh, person or hybrid if you'd like to still stay on zoom at the hillcrest ucc fellowship hall on december 8th we'll let you know if there's an outbreak and we won't be meeting then and then um, there's an eye care group food for thought that's getting organized to put together many many boxes 2400 boxes 600 bags of food for families in west county Excellent. Christine Nadeau is our moderator today, so we invite you to um, participate and uh, take it away, Christine. Yes, thank you so much, Will. So um, bear with me because I'm having a little, oh, there's my agenda, very good. Okay, um, welcome to all of you, and uh, we certainly had a wonderful day on Sunday. Um, huge thanks to those of you who contributed in any way, e either by uh, attending or by providing um, auction items or with your support. So thank you so much. Our first item for, um, the, for the business meeting is approving the October 13th minutes. And the link to that was on your agenda. And so could I see a show of hands of um, approvals? Christine, can you um, correct my last name spelling, please? I'm sorry, who's that? Sharon Campton. Sure. Um, it, it's showing as C O M P T O N on because I'm showing it on uh, the screen as uh, A M P C A N. That's correct. But if you could change it in the minutes. Oh, I, I'm sorry. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> I, will sorry do that. I should have been more specific. <laughs> no worries. I was thinking, where is that? Okay. That, that, thank you so much. Okay. okay. So the um, minutes are um, approved at, with that exception of a spelling. And um, <laughs> Uh, before, before the land acknowledgement, may I just um, ask for, for a couple of volunteers to read the um, reading of the covenant. And we can do that uh, one, uh, some to do the first two paragraphs and some to do the next two. Do we have any volunteers? Otherwise, I will ask Sharon. Reza, Reza raised his hand. Excellent. So uh, Reza and Sharon. If you could, um, Reza, if you could do the first two paragraphs, and Sharon, if you could do the next two. Okay, so let's do our land acknowledgement. As we acknowledge the lands on which we work, serve, and play upon, let us remember the first inhabitants of these lands, the Ohlone, the Amiwak, and the Tachiyokuts, all of whom consider Mount D to be sacred space. As we learn more about other indigenous peoples around the world, we um, are learning more about the Ainu people, are an indigenous people who primarily inhabit the island of Hokkaido in Japan, also live in the north on uh, Honshu, Japan's main island, and up in a Sakhalin island in Russia. There are more than 24,000 Ainu in Japan. While there are no official census figures, the Hokkaido government conducted surveys in uh, many years and have found that there's at least 19,786. The origins of the Ainu people itself are, as well as their language, are subject to contestation. Uh, while various hypotheses have been put forward, um, let me show some other pictures of them as a people because you may recognize them. Um, 
some proposing that the Ainu are linked to Mongolians, others suggesting the Ainu are Caucasian. The Ainu are probably an isolated Paleo-Asiatic people with no direct relations, a possibility which is partially supported um, by the classification of the Ainu language as a language isolate, meaning that like Basque, it does not appear to be related to any other living language. Aspects of traditional Ainu culture which have now almost completely disappeared were unique. After puberty, women were given distinctive tattoos such as around their mouths and wrists while men never shaved after a certain age. Both typically wore earrings. Ayinu were traditionally animist, believing that all things were endowed with a spirit or God. The Ayinu lived closely entwined with nature, their livelihoods relying on hunting, gathering, and fishing. Never shaving after a certain age, the men had full beards and mustaches, men and women alike cut their hair level with the shoulder at the sides of the head, trimmed semicircularly behind. The women tattooed uh, their mouths and sometimes their forearms. The mouth tattoos were started at a young age with a small spot on the upper lip gradually increasing with size. The soot deposited on a pot hung over a fire and birch bark was used for color. Their traditional dress was a robe spun from the inner bark or of the elm tree called Atusi or Atush. Various styles were made and consisted generally of a short robe with short sleeves, which was folded around the body and tied with a band around the waist. The sleeves ended at the wrist or forearm with the length generally was to the calves. Women also wore an undergarment of Japanese cloth. They also had a um, special relationship with the bear and um, a part of their veneration of the bear was part of their religious culture as well. Thank you. And now if we can have the reading of the covenant. And as we read this, um, realize that this is probably a very good reorientation for those of us who are already members and an orientation for those who are new. So Reza, if you would start. Our dialogue is an interfaith dialogue. We Okay. Our dialogue is an interfaith dialogue. We all um, have it's on the screen for you too, there, Reza. If you um, yes, uh, the screen. Okay. Sorry. We all have different communication styles and very varying views. We commit to be in dialogue with respect for all, expanding listening to hear multiple point of view. We realize that we are responsible for the growth of I for C, and each of us shares a duty to interfaith growth. The governing board provides leadership and the elected council works towards progress and the fulfillment of i for c goals as we grow. Oh, I think I read that instead of Reza, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Reza, go ahead and do the next one. We recognize that we are imbued with interfaith responsibility. As such, we commit to hold ourselves and each other accountable to merit that trust respect for the diverse traditions, belief and spiritual paths of all those we encounter. Hold ourselves to the highest ethical standards and accountable to our communities and to I for C. Our shared time together is interfaith time. We commit to honoring the start and end times each time we meet. Thank you both. And now we'll have an opening faith reflection by the Reverend Marie Wilson from the Concord UMC. Christine, I think we wanted to introduce our new folks first and then we'll have Marie go. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry, I forgot that. Um, so this is these are our new, uh, our newest um elected council members. Uh, first of all, Cynthia Peters of the First Church of Christian Science in Pleasant Hill. And Cynthia, if you'd raise your hand. Great. 
the Reverend Marie Wilson from Concord United Methodist, the Kate Lone Newkirk of the MDUUC. Couldn't be here today. She's uh, working with the CASA volunteer. And you just took off my screen. So will you read the rest? Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Uh, <laughs> Reverend Willie McDaniel from St. Peter CME El Cerrito, Reverend Michael Gonzalez, beautiful Redeemer Ministries Church in Richmond, who we'll hear from later, and Greg Kremenliev, Buddhist. Welcome. Excellent. Thank you, and welcome to you all. And do we have any um, guests today? Just raise your hand real quickly to let us know. Thank you. And just a reminder that guests are welcome at our meetings. And now, if we may have a reflection from the wonderful Marie Wilson. You are muted. Oh, there you go. Good morning. Right now, I'm super nervous now since you said I was so wonderful. <laughs> it's awesome to be here and uh, so excited to be elected to be a part of this interfaith group. And I, I didn't know where to begin and only have a few minutes. So I thought that I would share a little bit of just a little bit, a couple of minutes of my faith journey. And I hope that it will uh, it will be inspirational for all of us. Uh, I do have the ability to share my screen, so I'm going to do that. Well, it says the host disabled participant screen share. You should be good now. Yeah. Let's see. <coughs> right, share. Awesome. So I guess you can all see that. That's not what I want you to see. What I'd like you to see is this photo. Can everyone see that photo? Mm -hmm. Awesome. So I just wanted to begin to share um, again a little bit of my faith journey. Uh, Marie Wilson, Reverend Marie Wilson, I am the current pastor at Concord United Methodist Church, and I am a native Bay Area, native o from Oakland, California. Uh, and the photo that I'm showing you is uh, the foundation of, of one of the foundations of my faith. And it is my great grandmother on her wedding day. Mm -hmm. I grew up with this photo in my home and in every family member's home. And it's very special to me because in the photo, besides the lovely bride and groom who are my great grandparents, at the very, very top, there is a photo, I mean, there is a photo, there's a picture, a woman in the picture with a black hat and next to her on the right. So the lady in the black hat is my great, great, great grandmother, Sylvia Butler, oh. who uh, has uh, African-American but Native American roots, indigenous roots, and then my great, great grandmother, her daughter standing next to her. And I share that because uh, prior to me coming to Concord, I was at Sonoma United Methodist Church for a couple of years. Uh, but in prep before coming to Sonoma, uh, a series of interesting things happened. Um, in September 28, 2019, my husband had a hit ischemic stroke and brain hemorrhage, was hospitalized for 17 months, and subsequently passed away in February of last year. Mm. Uh, but while he was ill, I was appointed to Sonoma uh, as the first uh, Black person uh, to be the pastor during Black Lives Matter. There were all kinds of things happening. And uh, prior to that appointment, I was still on a job that I had for 20 years. Yes, I'm still young as you think I am, uh, but <laughs> started in my 20s and, and was hoping to transition out as I had just graduated from seminary and had not had an appointment. And so my husband got sick. I, I lost my what I thought was the security blanket, but then got a, a, a new job, but it was challenging. And so in this picture, I find my roots. My great grandmother was a staunch United Methodist. In fact, most people in this photo uh, so I'm about the fourth or fifth generation United Methodist. And one of the things I learned from her being able to grow up with her as a blessing is uh, her faith in, in God and in family. 
And so uh, she passed away in 2003 at 103. Uh, but I had many, many years with her. One of the things that I uh, took from her in faith is uh, she always sang all of the hymns without picking up a hymn book, every verse. Uh, so that is uh, one of the things that I hold on to now as I am trans having so many transitions, uh, looking to not just my faith in the divine and God, but also looking to the rich heritage of my family. And then uh, my um, great, great, great grandmother in the back, she was 115 in 1941 when she passed in Alameda. So that is my great grandmother's grandmother. And um, that has also been a, a rich heritage, strong women. And every time I think I can't do it, I look to this ancestor who I did not have the pleasure of meeting, but uh, whose strength uh, and resilience uh, resides in me. And I'm her wildest dreams, being able to go to wow. and you know get a master's degree in education. Uh, one of the things that was said about her was that she was uh, a brilliant seamstress and uh, that she could just look at you and pat you and be able to make these beautiful things. But she was always wanting all of her family to be educated and uh, all of her children, including my her grandchildren, my great grandmother and myself and many others, all are have college degrees and, and, and higher and doing wonderful things. And then the last thing I wanted to show you was her gravesite in Oakland. Uh, beloved mother, Sylvia. Uh, my great grandmother was named Sylvia well. So I hope I'm not rambling. I just wanted to share a little bit of what keeps me going in this time. And uh, that I'd like to share is uh, Isaiah 43, which says, and I had it somewhere. Perfect. Is it okay if I just pay you when I pick up? Uh, where is it? <laughs> Give me a half a second. Uh, I shared all of that because I feel like in the pandemic, our jobs as faith leaders have gotten, uh, gotten even more critical as we all have lost something. Uh, whether it be family members, which including my husband, I lost him. Uh, but we still have a, a great job to do. And one of the things that I think is important uh, for us to remember is that the divine, that God is still doing great things. We still have work to do. So I'll quickly share that scripture. And thank you for allowing me to share just a little bit of uh, my journey and how I come to you. Forget the former things, do not dwell on the past. Mm. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up, do you not perceive it? Last few years, I had a rough time perceiving it. But as I continue to uh, rest in my faith, in my beliefs in God, but also standing on the shoulders of those women and men that you saw in that first picture, I, re I realized that uh, God is continuing to do new things. And as change makers, which I think we all are, we have to remember that, uh, that we don't get stuck in the past. Uh, we can rest there and then we find our strength there and move forward. So I thank you for allowing me to share and just want to encourage all of you to remember that something new is happening every day. Every opportunity that we have to wake up, uh, we get to share in that miracle. Thank you. Oh, Reverend Marie, thank you so very much for sharing your such a rich heritage. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And now uh, I believe that uh, Will is going to be sharing his screen. These are some of the pictures from last Sunday afternoon at MDUUC for our th first Thanksgiving dinner. What a success it was. 
with uh, cultural presentations from Hindu dance and Oakland Interfaith Gospel Choir, recognizing Monument Crisis Center as an eye care partner, uh, recognizing Tamisha Walker with the Making a Difference Award, and uh, coming together as community to really build relationships. So there's some pictures from that if you missed it. We put some of the videos and photos on our Facebook page, so if you missed it, I'd please go there. We have a few things today, especially orientation for new elected council members and encourage you to take a look at the document that we sent to you as you became a elected council member. Um, here's some of that document and then we're going to go on to an eye care video and other pieces here as well. So this is right from that document. As with any volunteer activity, the more you commit and bring to an organization, the richer your experience. We hope that your involvement as an elected council member in the Interfaith Council of Contra Costa County will enrich you spiritually, personally, and professionally. Your participation, oh, let me let Nosley in. Your participation in the elected council will broaden your horizons, introduce you to people you might not otherwise meet, expand your awareness of other faith traditions and perspectives, and strengthen your understanding of your own practice as you share that with others. We are a small but growing organization and we need activist volunteers and an engaged elected council. We welcome your ideas and your involvement. So here's some of the ways that uh, you can further the goals and objectives of the Interfaith Council as we do our work together. And our dialogue, we really do consider um, the dialogues that we have each month in these meetings as primary for all of the other work and programs that we are able to do. Um, because it's out of that dialogue that we're able to know each other well enough to be able to serve well together. So we encourage you to approach all I4C activities with an attitude of being open-minded to all faith traditions and expressions. This mindset is essential in all we do. Um, you saw some of that expressed in our covenant and we're gonna go over that more next month uh, as we're considering updates to that document that Father Tom has been putting together for us. Uh, we encourage you to attend the monthly elected council meetings, and we understand when you're not able to, but um, if you're not able to attend a particular meeting, please go to our YouTube channel and uh, view the recording there. Participate in sharing from your faith tradition voluntarily or when asked, and we really do try to do as much mutual invitation as we can uh, so that we're uh, waiting for when folks are ready. And if you need to pass, that's always okay. Uh, and you can come back and share a little later when you feel more ready. Look for ways to get involved. There's lots of different programs. We do in, uh, consider our elected council members as ambassadors to your congregation and your neighborhood. Inform your congregation's religious leaders or clergy members of activities, events, and programs, including opportunities for volunteerism and engagement with eye care or eye change or any of our other programs like Singing Messengers and Social Justice Alliance. We encourage you to be a champion for us and enthusiastically encouraging your congregation to participate in our programming and projects and actively looking for opportunities to invite us to support your congregation with this programming. If you have an event that you'd like to invite the interfaith community to, if you go onto our website, you can, uh, uh, if you go to the events page, you can share an event and it submits a, uh, the event electronically to me. There's a little form you fill out and then I approve it and put it up on our events calendar. And then I know that you have something you're inviting the community to, and we can uh, get that into our e-blast as well. We encourage you to gather a group of your fellow congregants to volunteer in eye care, which is our interfaith service team or eye change projects supporting the young people, Reverend Julius Van Hook and Reverend Alexandria Spearman um, serve both inside and outside of juvenile hall and encouraging your congregation to donate to I4C and making a donation yourself so that you can afford. Now, of, of course, looking for ways to support I4C and active involvement with your special talents. As a small organization, we need the talent, experience, and energy of all of our members in order to grow, thrive, and help the greater community. You can serve on a committee, help with eye care as a regional representative, share your musical gifts at a concert or program, or help organize one of our programs. We do programs on International Women's Day, International Day of Peace, 
February 1st through 7th is always uh, World Harmony, Interfaith Harmony Week. And we love to do uh, interfaith programs in various congregations around the county uh, at those times. So please be active, enthusiastic, represent us. We're gonna get you uh, new folks some name tags. If you've lost your name tag in the meantime, please email me and I will order you a new name tag and um, share your ideas and perspectives with the governing board and with each other as we come together, because it really is the ideas that we come together with that we live with uh, and live out in our ministry. One of the ideas that came to fruition just about three years ago was the brainchild of Terry Moss and then Dave Longhurst has come alongside to be a real big part of our eye care ministry. And they put together this little video that will help explain how your congregation can be a part of an eye care service project. If you're as excited as I am about you and your congregation participating in one of these projects, you'll want to want to immediately sign up. I'm going to show you how to do that. First, go to the I4C website, click on programs, then I care. I'll take you to the main page. Just scroll down to the second paragraph and you'll see this link to the, our sign up genius. Click there. It'll take you to a landing page, which is some general information about eye care and your role as a sponsor of a project. Across the top, you'll see the other projects, including the Shelter Inc. and Afghan projects, that, the Afghan backpack projects that happened this weekend. Then scroll to the right and you'll find projects that don't yet have sponsors. Here's one, Opportunity Junction on February 1st. And you'll see, again, a description of the project, some forms that volunteers need to fill out. Just come down to this spot uh for a congregational sponsor click sign up sign up and submit and, and sign up it'll take you to a page where you just fill out your name and your email and then your religious affiliation click sign up now and and we are good to go and uh, of course that just kicks off the project planning meeting and we'll certainly support you every step of the way through that project And now we're excited to share with you a video that celebrates our first year of eye care service um showing all the good that we've done in the community and the partnerships we've created hope you enjoy actually we don't have that video that was uh, set up for a 2021 annual meeting um, but uh, that video is on our youtube channel and and so when in doubt go to youtube.com slash c slash Interfaith Council of Contra Costa County. If you write it all out, that'll get you there. And um, uh, we were hoping to have some experienced members of the elected council uh, submit their names as potential mentors for new elected council members, but you should consider any member of the governing board a potential mentor. And so if you're new and you are still trying to figure out how to um, uh, make your way or how how things are operating we'd love to be able to um to do that we uh, still have a few folks um uh, trying to get in so i'm going to work on that okay. christine if you can uh certainly. do the rest of the conversation around the parliament of the world's religions certainly and um we're, we're planning to send out to all of uh all of you with the um list of all of our congregations which right now totals about 109. So that, that way you can see who, who nearby you is um, already a member and um, you know, be able to, uh, to um, be in contact with them. And I like the word ambassador because that's exactly right. Uh, first of all, to your own congregation, then of course to, to other congregations. Now, we will also send out a list of the governing board members and their contact information so that if you do have questions meanwhile, you can certainly feel free to uh, uh, ask any of them or indeed any member of the council. Now, next summer, there's an exciting opportunity. The Parliament of World Religions is having their um, annual meeting in uh, Chicago. And usually it's outside of the country. So this is very exciting. It's actually within the country. And I think we have um, around five people already signed up. Dave, you can maybe update us on that. And um, if and Dave Longhurst is the person to talk to if you're looking for a roommate or you wish to do housing together. We're also look, looking into possibilities for Airbnb. 
but it should be a very exciting time. And that's going to be in uh, mid-August of next year. So I believe there's more information on that on our um, uh, webpage. And I just call your- It's important to register as early as, as possible because the rates will always be going up as we get closer to that date next, uh, next August. And you can always find housing after the fact, but get your registration first. Thank you. And um, uh, we've got so many committee reports that we're not going to go through them all, but we call your attention to the fact that there, the reports are on pages two through 10 of the agenda. So please feel free to, um, uh, to, to look at those. And Will, are we ready to do the dialogue of the day? I'll go ahead and- We are. That. Okay. Now the dialogue of the day is going to be, um, we're going to be discussing books and movies and documentaries that have had a memorable impact on us, whether inspiring or thought provoking or enraging or rejoicing or calling us to action, helping us to understand and appreciate other races, religions and cultures. Please be prepared to discuss your favorites and please have the recorder in your group make a list of them so that we can share the wealth of ideas. And here we are going to um, break into breakout groups, which is typically the way that we handle our dialogue at the monthly meeting. I'm going to give us um, some breakout rooms. Um, let's see here. Yes. We want uh, three to four people so that you can have plenty of time to be able to share. And so if it, um, you'll have to hit a join button as it comes up onto your screen. And again, do keep a record of um ones that of uh, what you of the um, individual things that you discuss, especially the names and titles and authors of books, movies, and documentaries. Thank you. And so if it's possible, if you would like, um, and uh, if you have some or I can you or you have a faith community that can collect glasses and then uh, maybe for the next month, collect some glasses and then I can I will pick them. I'll be glad to pick them up, take them over there um, uh, or whatever. But they they need reading reading glasses for the folks. Can you send that out in email to us? Because I, I think there are a lot of people who would be interested sure. in putting this together. Okay. Um, also, well, that brings us to- to well, let's add it to the minutes. And just a quick comment about uh, next month's meeting. We are gonna try to meet in person. Is that right? But-, but It's uh, hybrid. So those that well, can hybrid. meet in person can, yes. and those that can do Zoom, will have a Zoom option for you to have your, your breakout meeting in the middle of that. Thank you. And are there any other announcements? Uh, Eric and Dennis. So, uh, 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 Reverend Will had already put it in the chat earlier. So food for thought, we will be, uh, um, Dr. Adele uh, Weatherspoon is here, uh, Dr. Uh, Weatherspoon at Easter Hill and us at Temple Beth Halal, we will be actually packing food for, uh, you know, about 3000 people in the Richmond's most impoverished on Wednesday, December the 14th, I believe, Early in the morning, if anybody has trucks, F-150, some vans, and if you are, have any that you can drive in there, if you can email me, I would appreciate it because that's where we are somewhat short. We are short a couple of trucks. Hopefully, you know, uh, I, I will- Friday's the delivery day? It is the Wednesday uh, on the 14th. And so we need all the truck drivers and van drivers to get there by eight o'clock. Uh, you will come to Temple Bath Halal if you in the last minute decide to come because Dr. Weatherspoon is going to be, Easter Hill, we'll make sure all the uh, uh, trucks that's needed go there first. And then anyone spare that needs to come will come to Temple Bath Halal. Enrichment, by the way. Mm. It's the hilltop exit. 
at Hilltop, right? So if you just email me and I will see exactly where the need is, and then I will send people there. Dr. Weatherspoon, you're fine. We have gotten enough volunteers for <laughs> your packing. Hey, hey Erica, right. it's, it's Dave, Dave, Dave here. Um, what, what, if people do email you, please send them to the Sign Up Genius and let's get people signed up there for sure. That's right. That's what I'm going to do is as soon as I get the numbers, I'm going to put it there so we know exactly how we're doing on numbers. Thank you, okay. Dave. Yes, that's my plan. Uh, Eric, Other sorry, this is Rodney. Um, I know that our our congregation is also helping co-sponsor. So if there's anything specific, I'll I'll put out and ask for trucks. But if there's anything else you need, just let me know. I think you're working with one of our congregants, so she may already know all this. Yes, perfect. Well, thank you. Yes. Dennis had his hand up. I did. Uh, uh, on uh, November 16th, which is next Wednesday. FAME is going to present a housing justice workshop. And that's going to be at from 10 a.m. to 12 noon. And it's at Murray's uh, congregation. Yeah, it's going to be at the United Methodist Church in, yeah, Marie's congregation in Concord, United Methodist in Concord. And uh, there will be options for uh, both in person and uh, and on Zoom. And uh, it's going to be a panel discussion with uh, discussion afterwards and so on. So should be very beneficial. So and uh, I'll, I'll put, I think that's uh, isn't that on our website already? Will or uh, I think it is. Yes. Page? Yeah, I think it's on there already. Thank you. Any other announcements? I have a quick question. Can something like the, the call for um, glasses, can something like that be put on uh, the sign up genius? Dave would have to Dave? Honor, uh, uh, answer that, I think. Yeah, I think what it? you mean is can that be an eye care project? Is that what you asked? Right, me? that's kind of what I write. Sorry. Dave, are you there? Oh, we, we can. We can figure that out later. And if so, we'll let people know. So any other announcements? Okay. Then uh, Reverend Michael Gonzalez, welcome to the Interfaith Council. You're gonna yes. share, uh, ask you to unmute here. Let me just uh, spotlight so everyone can see you. Please do our closing faith reflection. Hey, thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, I am going to uh, share my screen. Is that, can you enable that to happen? You're set, ready to go. Okay, let me see. I'm sorry, I'm not seeing it. Okay, all right. All right, so I am uh, Michael Gonzalez. I am the senior pastor at Beautiful Redeemer Ministries. Um, this is where I grew up uh, in, in Baby Hunters Point, specifically Hunters Point. And um, I grew up literally right across the street, separated by barbed wire fence from the Naval Shipyard at Hunter's Point, which later I would come to know was an EPA Superfund site. Uh, from the very beginning, I knew something was wrong. Number one, even as a young child, it felt particularly cruel that there was a barbed wire fence separating our housing community from the Naval Shipyard. And as a young child, all I saw was the white Naval officers living on one side of the fence and um, Black or African Americans living in housing projects on the other side of the fence, and then men with uh, machine guns patrolling between the two. It felt, it felt uh, wrong. And even though I didn't understand fully, it just felt wrong. The second thing was then I just had this sense, always had this sense um, that um, that God was on the side of righteousness. And uh, and so it, it shaped very early in my life being born and raised in the 1950s and early 60s that um, 
that love would promote justice and that justice would promote love. And so it kind of engendered in me the sense of I need to be a part of something that's doing something about the situation. And this is actually Third Street, uh, which was the main commercial area in Bayview Hunters Point at the time of me growing up. And you can see a very powerful visual of uh, sort of mm -hmm. like the precursor to Black Lives Matter, just simply stating, I am a man. And for some reason, that was threatening to the powers that be. And uh, the military was called out, uh, obviously, to watch people walk down the street declaring their humanity. Uh, so I was always guided by this sense of righteousness will prevail, that at some point, the uh, as Martin Luther King said, the long arc of the universe bends towards righteousness, and it does so because God is righteous. And I always felt that God was with us, God would enable righteousness to um, to prevail, and that even those who were on the side of unrighteousness because of whatever life circumstances uh, had, had had pushed him in that direction, that God was going to do something to help all of us to be able to function in a way that was uh, would give him the glory. So I, I come out of a Methodist tradition. I was born in a household that was United Methodist, Jones specifically, Jones Methodist Church, which was very uh, community oriented and being raised, like I said, during the civil rights movement, being um, growing up in San Francisco, California in particular, and having a Methodist background, it led me toward uh, James 2 and 17, that faith without works is dead. Mm -hmm. And therefore my whole life has been about faith, it's been about helping, it's been about the individual, uh, it's been about uh, trying to do what you could to end systemic uh, oppression of people, whether it be systemic racism or systemic injustice in the criminal justice system, systemic miseducation, uh, that's been my life uh, work. Uh, there were some lost years in my life between 1980 and 1993, where coming out of a civil rights kind of background and just being disappointed with um, the faith community during that time and being actually distracted by my own youth and my own lust, uh, just being taken away from the church, taken away from faith, taken away from who I am. But, you know, the Bible does declare that when you find a wife, you find a good thing. So I found a wife who was very steeped in uh, the, the faith community and we began having children. And then we located a Pentecostal non-denominational home uh, in, in, in about 1992, 93-ish. And from there, uh, being faithful in that tradition, I was called the shepherd in 2007. And at that point, my wife and I founded uh, Beautiful Redeemer Ministries in Richmond, California, where we try to operate on three different tiers. Tier one being operating in such a way that we build up our own faith and relationship with God through uh, a holy lifestyle. Uh, two, work with others, whomever they may be that are working to address issues in the community. And that so collaborating with others that are like-minded. And then the third uh, uh, tier is to then look at what are the systems in place that are continuing the um, miseducation, the oppression, the uh, degradation of people, and how through faith in God and direction from the Holy Spirit, uh, we can be guided in addressing those issues and 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 really uh, living life that uh, promotes righteousness in the community. So that is my faith journey from 1955 to 2002 <laughs> and, 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 and a quick summary of who I am. We do, like I said, four children, one grandson. Welcome to the council. Thank you. So great to get to know you and Reverend Marie and we'll be hearing more from our other new um, elected council members over the next couple of months. Some of them couldn't be here with us today, but hopefully we'll be able to see the recording and we'll be sharing the report back on all of the different books and movies and documentaries and 
even museum presentations uh, have been included in this. So please email those to me and we'll get them to you as our minutes. And we'll uh, look forward to going deeper. We, um, we do a book study on our Meaningful Mondays. During COVID, we met every Monday and it was a time for folks to check in with each other and support each other. But now that we're out of COVID, uh, we're only meeting on the first Mondays unless it's a holiday and then we're meeting on the second Mondays. And we'll be finishing up the book Holy Envy by Barbara Brown Taylor next month. So it's chapter 12 in the epilogue for that. But we'll be choosing a new book to read. And if you want to be a part of that reading group, uh, Breza Sharafsi Day uh, is our leader for that uh, uh, program. And it's the first. So December 5th is the next one. But we'll be um, choosing a new book to read for next year. And so if you want to be a part of choosing what that book is, come to the next meeting on December 5th. And then, of course, our December meeting, we're going to go a little deeper into what, um, you know, how the dialogues will, will really enable us to be able to go deeper in our conversations with one another. Anything else for the good of the order? Diane? Hi, Earl. I would just like to, uh, again, thank the um, elected council for all that they did for the fundraiser and all your donations and wonderful participation um countless hours um that you have helped uh with the fundraiser and we'll give you updates when we finalize um all the update the updates the, the report uh, maybe in a week or two or through email and i want to thank the board for everything that they did mm -hmm. it was in the agenda there but um it's a community effort and um it's through all all our uh, connectedness that makes this little area of the world a better place. And I'd just like to remind everyone that um, our $20,000 matching grant is uh, more than halfway um, subscribed, but it's still open for uh, additional um, donations. And that's great. Okay. Oh, and also you're always welcome to invite somebody either on Zoom or in person to our meetings. We want to teach more and more folks how to do interfaith dialogue so that we can learn how to get along with each other, which is the basis for all of the work that we do together. So thank you all. And hopefully we'll hear from Father Tom at our next meeting as well. And help, help take us through a process to go deeper in our dialogues. Thank you so much and have a blessed day. Thank you all.